welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Are you guys ready to get into the word of the Lord tonight? Well, praise God. I know I am. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, would you join me as we go before the Lord and standing in reverence and in in honor for, for God? Lord, we come before you in this place. Lord, I'm excited that we are here in the house of the Lord. You can feel the energy. It's eclectic in the place today. It's electric. God, that's because we don't come here to hear from a man. Not a white man, not a black man, not a brown man, or an Asian man, or, or any other color. Father, we don't come for a, a woman, or to, for the young, or for the old, for Pastor Jim, for Pastor Dan, for Pastor Luke. We don't come to hear from men, God, because we know that men have nothing to say. Lord, we come into this place to hear from you, and we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is a senior leader of this church. And so, Father, it's in that name of Jesus Christ that we ask that your Holy Spirit speak to us today, to minister to us, to bring things to our remembrance. Lord, as we open up the word of God and we rightly divide the truth, Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would would reveal things to us, reveal things about us. Open our eyes, God. Open our uh, our ears to hear, Father, that we would see your word, that we would hear your word, Father, and that we would apply your word to our lives. God, we give you the glory and the praise. Father, we don't ask the blessings just upon ourselves, but Lord, we ask that you would bless every church around the Inland Empire, all around the world that's preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't think of ourselves as better than anybody, but Lord, as co-laborers in the body of Christ. Lord, it's with that that we lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we thank you that you set your hand upon them as well. In Jesus' mighty name, and we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. I'm excited for what God's got in store for us tonight. A message that's been on my heart for some time, just been kind of thinking about it, building upon it in my heart and in my mind, and I know that tonight is a great night for us to dig into the Word of the Lord. If you've got your Bibles, why don't you go ahead and turn with me to the book of Ephesians. We're going to go to the book of Ephesians in the fifth chapter. Ephesians in the fifth chapter. Tonight, I want to title tonight's message, I always try to figure... You know, I think that's kind of the hardest part of messages. It's not, it's not building them. It's not assembling them. It's not trying to get a, a, a thought together or anything like that. But rather, I think one of the, the most difficult parts of messages is trying to come up with a title. So tonight, I figured what we would call tonight's message is I wanted to title it Copycats. You're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Tonight, I want to talk to you about being copycats. And you, guys, you guys know what, when I say the word copycat, do you understand what that means to be a copycat? Does I just want to make sure before we even get started that I'm not talking about felines, I'm not talking about cats that are outside, you know, you know, no, 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 that's not where I'm going with it. I'm talking about imitating or, or, or copying things. You remember as a kid, and I don't know if you guys remember this, as brothers and sisters, I used to do this to my sister and she would also uh, return the favor to me. Remember when your brothers or your sisters would say something and you repeat it right after and they say, stop repeating me, stop repeating me. I, I, you know, you would do that just to bug them and just keep repeating and copying them, and it would just drive them nuts. You need you guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, well, today I want to talk to you about being copycats, but not in a negative sense, in, an, in, a, in, a, in a positive sense. I want to read to you a statement. I want to say to you a statement. I'm sure you've heard it before, and I'm going to maybe shed some light on it, but you've probably heard the statement. It, it goes like this. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Has anybody ever heard that before? Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. I'm surprised. Raise your hands if you've heard that before. Because I, okay, okay. I was like, at first I was like, man, where, are you, where have you guys been? Okay, but most of you have heard that. Uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. What that means is that in the sense, if someone truly values somebody else, they're going to copy them or they're going to do uh, like them. They're going to follow in their footsteps because they want to be like them. You know what I'm saying? Does that, does that make sense? So imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. I want, let me shed some light again. Uh, that, the statement, if you ever wanted to know, it's not just some proverb. It actually came from a man by, by the name of Charles Caleb Colton. Uh, and, and so I always just thought it was some proverb with no name attached to it, but I guess it actually came from a man. Uh, I want to read you another statement from, from a Roman emperor named Marcus Aurelius. Now, if you've ever seen the movie Gladiator, you know Marcus Aurelius was, the, was the, uh, the emperor portrayed by the actor Richard Harris, and he was Marcus the Wise and Marcus the Wonderful. But the truth of the matter is, is to you and I, Marcus Aurelius was a, 
was a pretty rough Roman emperor. He was one of the worst emperors to, to persecute Christians in church history. I know this because I teach church history. But Marcus Aurelius, he was not a Christian, did, did not support Christians, persecuted Christians. He was the one that put Christians in, in, in uh, animal skins and put them in the uh, Colosseum and put lions and tigers after them. I mean, it was a grotesque, gruesome sight. But Marcus Aurelius said of his pagan gods, now I'm going to paraphrase his pagan statement or his secular statement into a Christian statement because I think it holds some truth to it. So bear with me as I take what somebody meant for secularism or paganism and I make it into Christianity. Marcus Aurelius said, said this, consider that imitation is the most acceptable part of worship and that God would rather mankind imitate him than flatter him. Now, we just said that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Now, here's this Roman emperor talking about his pagan gods, but we turn that thought, that, that thought that carries logic, that carries some meaning behind it, and we turn that thought around, and let's apply it to God, and it says that God would rather you and I imitate him than flatter him, than do something just to please God, or do something just to, to, to blow smoke and, 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 and make God think that, uh, that we're good. But rather, God would rather see us live a life of imitation than flattery. Interesting thought. Now, with that being said, I want to show it to you in the Word of God. I had you turn to the book of Ephesians, and we're talking about being copycats. And let me show you what Ephesians says. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, the very first verse of the fifth chapter says, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Verse number two. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So hear what Paul the Apostle is saying to the church in Ephesus. He's speaking to you, and I will see this in just a moment. In the uh, first verse, let's go back to verse number one, is Paul is encouraging you and I to be imitators of God. This isn't the first time that Paul tells us. As a matter of fact, in the book of 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, Paul the Apostle tells us to imitate him who imitates Christ. So if you go through the log logical equations and you go through all the thoughts of a logic and you can remove Paul from the equation because Paul imitates Christ. We're to imitate Paul who imitates Christ. Therefore, you and I are to imitate Christ. So you and I are to be copycats of God. And if we hold any form of sincerity, if we hold any form of value to God, then in our lives we would reflect the nature, the character, and the attributes of God. Are you with me this morning? I like how he, 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 he explains it in the first verse. And he says, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Now, I love this because just the other day, my little boy Bjorn, he's 22 months old or 21 months old, so right in the middle between the two. He's, he's in that sponge age. You guys know what I'm talking about when he's a sponge? It's like no matter what we do, he, he's watching, and it's like, oh, no, now we really have to watch what we say. We have to watch what we do, you know. And my boy, my little boy is a sponge. I remember the other day, we had some family members over, and I was talking to one of my cousins, and I had my hands in my pockets like this, just both hands in my pockets, and I was talking to him, and I was talking to my cousin, and I was just kind of swaying like this, and we were just kind of carrying on a conversation, and we were just swaying. And all of a sudden, I look over, and here's Bjorn, my little 20-month-old boy, and he's got his hands in his pockets. Now, I have never seen my son with his hands in his pockets because he's just got too much energy to contain his hands in his pockets. But here's my little boy, and he's looking up at me, and he's standing right next to me, and he's got his hands in his pockets, and he's swaying too. <laughs> and I thought, wow, there it is. My little boy wants to be like Dad. And he's imitating me. You know, it just, it blessed me as a dad. You know, I look back and say, wow, there's a period I remember when, you know, I wanted to be like my dad. And then you grow up into that teenage years and you don't want to be anything like your dad. And then you realize, <laughs> you realize the older that you get, the more inescapable it is. And you look at yourself one day in the mirror and you say, I am my dad. <laughs> I grew this little like red, you know, and you can see it's like this little, and for me, I got red facial hair. I didn't get that part of my dad. I got that part of my mom. So I was growing this little scruff. You know, I wouldn't even call it facial hair, just scruff. And one day I decided to shave it off, and I was like, my goodness, I have my dad's chin. <laughs> Can't escape it. But imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. So if you and I, if we want to show the fact that we place value in God in our lives, wouldn't we then, instead of trying to flatter God, 
with the outward motions or going through the motions, wouldn't we want to, in, in reality then, imitate him? To imitate God, to imitate the nature, the character, the attributes of God in our lives. And this is exactly what Paul the Apostle is telling us, is that you and I, if we really place a value on God, that you and I should imitate God. Interesting enough, I won't say much about it. If you were not here for this Sunday morning's message, I want to encourage you to log on to the Rock Church and watch or listen to Pastor Jim's message talking about obedience. It's a two-part series. This was just part number one. I don't want to spend too much time because we don't got time. We got a lot to cover, but you need to listen to it because this really ties in uh, to what Pastor Jim had to say on Sunday morning, and it really will open your eyes, and you need to hear that. Go get the CD after service or go online. It's free online and watch it or listen to it. I promise you, you will not be the same after you hear that. But with that being said, if you and I value God, shouldn't we strive to be more like him? Tonight what I want to do is I want to take a look at what imitators of God look like from Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Paul the Apostle, as he's writing to the church, paints a picture in the fifth chapter as he speaks this, as he writes this, about what imitators of God look like. But before Paul the Apostle paints a picture or, or, or shows us the illustration or describes to us what the imitators of God look like in Ephesians the fifth chapter, he starts in verse number three with a contrast and shows us what those who do not imitate God look like. So in order for us to be, uh, to be thorough, I can't spend a lot of time in verses three through 14, but I don't want to just skip over them. I want to read them to you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read them to you, not in the New King James translation, what we normally use, but I'm going to read to you out of the New Living Translation because it's a more modern translation. It uses the English that you and I speak, so it's easier to understand. Now, if we were going to go about this and really dig into this line upon line, precept upon precept, like we're going to do on the, on the second half of, the, of this statement, then I would read it to you in the New King James because then we can go and I can tell you about the words and we can take an in-depth study. But be, for, the, for the sake of time and for the sake of understanding, I'm going to read verses 3 through 15, or 3 through 14 out of the New Living Translation. It will be on the Old Overhead. If you have a, a smartphone or something like that, you probably got the Bible on there anyways. You can follow along there. But what we're going to do is we're going to look. And here Paul the Apostle is painting the opposite picture of what somebody who does not look like an imitator or somebody who does not imitate God, who, what they look like. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter and the third verse out of the New Living Translation, it'll be up on the overhead. Verse number three says, let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Right off the bat, not going to spend a lot of time here, but it's unescapable, it is unavoidable right here because of that statement that we know that Paul the Apostle is talking to the church. He is talking to you and I. A lot of times what we try to do to muddy up the waters is we say, oh, he's not talking to the church about this. He's talking to the sinners or he's talking to the agnostics. or he's Listen, right off the bat, he tells us, I'm talking to you. And so he says, don't let there be sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. They don't have a place among God's people. Verse number four, obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes. These are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. For you can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. That's a very harsh and somber warning for you and I to take what he's about to tell us in the terms of being imitators of God to take it serious. To, even though we're having fun and even though we're laughing to understand that here Paul is issuing a real serious shot across the bow to the church saying that this is not a game, this is not a joke, but really you and I have got to be, not just we should be, you and I have got to be imitators of God. So he goes on to say, you can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall upon all who disobey him. Don't participate in the things that these people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have the light from the Lord. So live as a people of light. Paul the Apostle saying, listen, at one point in your life, you did these things. At one point in your life, you were in the dark. You were ignorant to what you did. You had no idea of what you did. But now you are here. Now you know who Jesus is. Now you know of the kingdom of God. And now the light has been shown upon you like a flashlight or like turning a light on. And the cockroaches have been exposed. 
So Paul the Apostle says, you are in the light, live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good, right, and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. Interesting that he tells you and I to not just don't take part in them, but he doesn't say don't skirt around and keep your mouth shut. He says expose them. That's a message in itself. I can't go there tonight. Oh, but I would love to go there. I would love to talk to you about Achan and, and, and Joshua, but maybe that's a, another night. He says don't expose them. Verse number 12, it is shameful even to talk about the things that the ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines upon them. You remember that illustration I just gave you about cockroaches in the light? There he goes. For the light makes everything visible. That is why it is said, awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead and Christ will give you light. So here he's again, Paul addresses you and I, the church, because remember, we know un unmistakably that he's talking to us. And he says, there was a time when you lived in the dark. But now, because of Christ and because of salvation and because of what you've known, because the fact that you're sitting here tonight, the light has been shined upon you, and now you are in the light. You are yourself a light shining in a dark world. So therefore, live like you are a light. In other words, back to verse number one, imitate God, Christ, the light. So now we come to, now we find ourselves in verse number 14. And out of verse number 14, in the fifth chapter, through the, the, the 21st verse, I want to give you some things about now Paul the Apostle begins to shift his focus back to looking at what people who serve, what people who imitate God look like. Paul begins to paint the picture. He gives us the illustration of how we should live. He just told us how we should not live. So now he's saying, okay, now that I've said all that, now let's look at how you should live. So now from this point on, I'm going to look at these verses. We'll go back to the New King James Version because now we can dissect it a little bit more. And we're going to talk about some subjects. I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to give you this statement if you're taking notes. The statement is, imitators of God are... And then we'll fill it in with a descriptive word. Are you guys with me tonight? Are we okay? We're talking about copycats and imitating God. Are you here tonight still? You're like, man, I, I, I don't know if I should have come. No, you should have been here. It's good. I, I know you'll get something out of this because we all strive to do this. And it's not a beat you down message. This is a build you up message. I believe in, in Jesus' name. So when you and I imitate God, when you and I copy God, there's some things that we ought to look at. And there's some hope and there's some, there's some relief in our lives. But we're talking about imitators of God. Let's look at them out of Ephesians, the fifth chapter. First one for this, this, this evening is imitators of God are wise. Now we're talking about God. God is the maker of all things, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. There's none above God. There, uh, God, there's nothing that, can, that we can hide from God. The Galatians in the sixth chapter tells us that God cannot be mocked. God cannot be fooled. We can't pull the, the wool over God's eyes because God knows everything. So if you and I want to imitate one attribute of God, the one attribute of God that is unmistakable, that is undeniable, is that God is a God of wisdom because he knows everything. I mean, you and I, if we would define wisdom in our day and age, it would be the collection or the, the accumulation of knowledge. He who knows the most knows the most, right? You don't go to somebody, you don't go to your five-year-old or your three-year-old, although it's interesting to hear what their, their statements are going to be. Bill Cosby had a whole TV show about that, and ask them for wisdom because they don't know. But the fact is, is that God knows all. And if you and I are to be imitators of God, God is a wise God. Therefore, you and I are to be wise followers of God. And God doesn't, his desire for us, his will for us is to not go about life acting rash or acting out of, or out of, out of foolish desires or acting out of ignorance. God is a God that his desire for you and I is to be wise, is to be, Jesus tells his disciple as he sends them out, to be wise as, as, as serpents and harmless as doves. So it is in God's will for you and I to be wise. That's why we have the Bible. 
Because it's God's intention for us to read it. And as we read it, we just define what wisdom is. Wisdom is the, the collection or the accumulation of knowledge. And how many you know the more you read about the Bible, or the more you read the Bible, the more you know? Isn't that like a statement from like Channel 4 from 20 years ago? You remember that little star, the more you know? Hey, the more you read, the more you know. So God's intention for us to be copycats or to be followers of him is to be wise. Ephesians 5th chapter, 15th verse, that's where we're picking off. Are, are, are resuming from, Paul says, See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So Paul says, see that you walk circumspectly. Circumspectly means to be cautious, to be wary. He says, see that you live a cautious or a careful life to walk your life out in a state of wisdom, not foolishness. So there he's saying, listen, I've just told you about all the looks and all the ideas and, and the understanding that you are not going to see heaven if you live a life that is all contrary to the things of God. But now that you know that, you ought to be careful to make sure that you live a life of wisdom. But because we don't use that word circumspectly very often, I don't know if I can ever say that I've pulled that out in a sentence before. Let me show it to you in the New Living Translation, a more modern translation. I'll go ahead and put it up on the overhead. It says... I won't put it up on the overhead. Okay, let me read it to you. Verse number 16. Oh, I don't have it. That's why. Circumspectly. Okay, I, I'm, going, I'm jumping ahead of myself. The video department's back there freaking out. It's all right. We'll go there in a minute. See that you walk circumspectly, meaning see that you walk cautious or wary of life. You know, the thing is, is that you and I have the opportunity to get wisdom. You and I have something that nobody else has. We have a library that no book could contain, that, that no walls could contain the amount of knowledge. I should say not no book contains, but no walls could contain the amount of knowledge. You know, there's great libraries in Europe and in, and in Italy and France and all these areas that are a collection of thousands of years of knowledge. And you can go and you can even read scrolls and things from ancient writings. But, you know, no library that is accessible to mankind that is physical pales in comparison to what you and I have, and that is you and I have access to God Almighty when it comes to living a life in wisdom. When Paul tells us to walk cautious, to be careful that we live as wise, not as foolish, that we don't make brash or, or, or rash decisions in our life, we don't, we're not empty-handed. Remember I told you that this is a message of hope. This is a message, a build you up message. You know, I love, it's one of my favorite verses. It's one of the verses I tell people all the time out of James in the first chapter. Now, I know we have this. We'll go and put this one up on the overhead. James in the first chapter, fifth verse says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. I love that. That alone, that statement alone would have been enough for me to say, Praise God, I'm glad that I can ask God for wisdom. But listen, you know what? James doesn't stop with that. He gives us a little bit of description about the character, the nature, and attributes of God. And he says, let us ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. It means that God's not going to be stingy with wisdom when you ask God for it. God, I need to understand how to make a wise decision in my life. God, I need to understand the right words to say to my wife. God, I need to understand the right way as an employee or God, the right way as an employer. God, I need to understand, I need wisdom on how to deal with this situation at hand. The Bible says that God's not going to be like, all right, I'll give you a little bit. No, it says that God gives to us liberally and without reproach. Meaning God says, I'll give it to you and I'm not going to just take it back. It's yours. All you and I have to do is ask. Now, the verse goes on to say in 6, 7, 8, 9 that we've got to ask God and ask in faith to understand that God will give it. If we ask and we doubt that God's going to give it, God, give me wisdom. Eh, I don't think I'm going to get it. It was worth a try. The Bible says you're not going to get anything. When you ask God, you know that God's going to give it to you. So you say, God, I need wisdom, and I know it's on its way towards me. So, Lord, I thank you for that wisdom in Jesus' name because I want to imitate you. And you get it. It's just that simple. All we got to do is go before God and ask. Open your Bible. Read the Word of God. It's there for you. The more you read, the more you know. <laughs> We're talking about, well, let me show you something. Let me give me, give me an example of wisdom. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. You can read about this in Luke, the fifth chapter. It's not going to be on the overhead because I'm just going to paraphrase to you. Luke in the fifth chapter, Jesus is teaching and there's a man, he's a paralytic and he's got some friends and they want to get him in to, in to see Jesus because they know that Jesus could heal. The, the Bible tells us that the Spirit of God was there healing people. And the crowd, that he, Jesus was talking in this house and, and there were so many people that they couldn't get in. 
So they bring this man. They, I mean, imagine this. In your, I mean, if I was a homeowner in this story, I'd be a little bit mad, but thank goodness for homeowners insurance. They say, we got to get our friend to Jesus. So they go up and they climb up on the roof and they peel the roof tiles back and they lower their friend into the house. Hello. Thank goodness it was the dry season. And Jesus looked at the man and he says, your sins are forgiven. Now the Bible tells us right after he tells them, your sins are forgiven, the Bible goes on to say that there were some Pharisees in there and there were, there were some uh, uh, scribes there and they were kind of judging and reasoning. It says you, they were reasoning in their hearts. Now the interesting thing is, is if you read the accounts of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, on several occasions the Bible tells us that Jesus knew the condition of their hearts. So here's Jesus teaching. He says to this guy, your sins are forgiven. And he can tell, he can sense the condition of the Pharisees, the scribes, and, 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 their, and their, their hearts. So you can see that they're having a hard time with a man who says, who is this guy? They say in their hearts, who is this guy that he's able to forgive sins? Isn't that God's job? So Jesus looks to them knowing that, talking about wisdom. How about wisdom to say, I know what you're thinking before you're thinking it. So Jesus looks to them and says, what's easier? For somebody to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise up and walk? Here's a guy laying on a bed, can't move. That's a pretty impossible situation. It's easy to say your sins are forgiven because nobody knows if his sins are really forgiven, right? It's not an immediate result. So Jesus says it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. So I'll take the high road and I'll show you the complicated result. And he turns to the paralytic and is in the bed and he says to him, rise, take up your bed and walk and go home. Right then the guy jumps out of bed, takes up, his, takes up his bed, carries the cot that they lifted him down from the roof in, and goes home. <laughs> Wisdom is having the right answer at the right time. It's having the right situation, having the right thought, having the right mindset. Wisdom is not always, let me say this, wisdom is not always saying something that is right to somebody else. Sometimes wisdom is learning when to say nothing at all. You see, so wisdom is not just about the words of your mouth, but wisdom comes from God. And all you and I have got to do to imitate God, to copy God, is to be wise. And we can go before God and say, God, hey, I need it. You want me to be an imitator of you? I want to be an imitator of you. Therefore, I need your wisdom, not mine. Are you guys with me tonight? We're talking about imitators of God, looking at, the, uh, looking at some descriptives. Uh, imitators of God, number two, are opportunistic. Imitators of God are opportunistic. Hey, imitators of God don't sit around on the couch. Now, I use this word. I'm, I'm, I might get myself in a lot of trouble. I use this word in the young adults, so if, if, it's, if it's offensive, I apologize, and I won't use it again. But imitators of God don't sit around on the couch on their duff. Is that, is that Okay. Is that all right? All right, okay. I, you know, don't throw any rocks at me yet. And wait for opportunity to come to them. Imitators of God are opportunistic. They make the best of every situation. Because imitators of God have an understanding. Remember we talked about that wisdom. We have an understanding that life, the Bible tells us, is a vapor. And therefore, because our life is short, we have got to make the most of every situation because we don't have a lot of time here. And if we don't have a lot of time, even though 70 years to us, 80 years, 90 years may feel like a lot of time, in the grand scheme of eternity, it's nothing. That we've got to make the most of every opportunity of everything that we have been given here. I was listening to somebody say something. You've heard this term, to much is given, much is... How about this? To, much, to, to someone who is given something, something is required. If you're given a lot, a lot's required. If you're given a little, a little's required. So that means that if you're given something at all, that something is required of you. And you and I have been given this opportunity right now to <gasps> breathe in, breathe out, to exist in this moment. Therefore, something is required of you and I. And that is to make an opportunist, or take the, every opportunity that we have to serve God, to be imitators of God. You're like, Pastor Luke, man, I don't know, I don't know. All right, Ephesians, the fifth chapter, 16th verse, it says, Paul's saying, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. You're like, dude, I don't know about that. Okay, Ephesians, the sixth, fifth chapter, 16th verse, this is the one that the video department has. Let me show it to you in modern English so that it understands a little bit more. It says, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. 
hey, you know what the, you know what the comforting fact is? Is that 2,000 years ago, Paul the Apostle wrote this to the church. And the days were evil. You know, you and I live in some evil days. But we're not alone. 2,000 years ago, Christians were wrapped up in animal skins, thrown to live animals, while everybody cheered at them. We don't have it that bad. And here he's saying, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. This coming from a man who lost his life serving God. Make the most out of every opportunity. We are opportunistic in our imitation of God. Let me ask you this question. I, and you, don't, you don't have to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you because it's probably, you, you know, they, may be, they might even be sitting next to you. But have you ever seen someone coming your way? and didn't want to engage them in conversation or be asked that question, so you went the other way? Have you ever, maybe let's say you've ever been into a, gone into a gas station or, or drove towards the gas station, you saw that guy, and you know what the story was, and you're like, you know what, I'm going to go to that other gas station because I just don't really feel like being hassled. Have you ever been sitting outside and you see those guys with the white shirts and the black ties and the bicycle helmets. Tim and Robin can know what I'm talking about because one time, Tim and Robin, I see Craig and Shauna, they were sitting there. I had just preached the message about living life to the fullest. And sure enough, as I'm driving home on a Saturday morning, Tim and Robin are my neighbors. There are the Mormons in their white shirt and their black ties. And what I did, I pulled into the garage and before I even got out of the car, I shut the garage door. Has anybody ever avoided somebody because you didn't want to take advantage of the opportunity? We are all guilty of it in some form or fashion. You're all guilty of seeing that person at work or that person that you know, or when you ask them, they're going to give you some sour puss attitude or some, some horrible sob story about life, and you say, man, I'm just not even going to ask them. They're coming your way, and they make eye contact with you, and you kind of turn your head the other way. Oh, I had to go to the bathroom real quick, and I'm going to go over here. Because you're avoiding... Dealing with the situation. You know, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. You've been there before. And now, is, am I saying that you got to say yes or you got to give every person that asks you for change the money in your pocket? Am I saying that every time somebody comes to you and wants to give you your sob story, you got to talk to them? No, but what I am saying is that you and I, as, as, as Christians, you and I, as imitators of God, have got to look at every situation and see the opportunity within. Whether it's a positive or it's a negative, we have such a short amount of time that we can't afford to live this life waiting for opportunity to come and present itself to us. It's out there wherever we are. It's out there in our workplaces. It's in our families. It's with our friends. It's in our schools. It's with our relatives. It's wherever we go, opportunity is there. And you and I, as imitators of God, have got to be opportunistic. Are you with me tonight? I know it got a little bit quiet. Some of you are staring at me like a cow at a new gate, but it's okay. We'll move on. You know, before we move on, let me give you another real quick paraphrase. I'm running out of time, but I'm having fun. So, you get to deal with me. No, I'm just kidding. In Mark, the sixth chapter, you can read about this. I won't have you turn there again because I know we got a lot to cover. In Mark, the sixth chapter, Jesus is an opportunistic person. Oh, I love Jesus' opportunities. Here Jesus is teaching to the multitude. The disciples come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, it's getting late. There's no more food. Tell everybody who's listening to your message to go away. Go get dinner. Come back some other day. And we'll, have to, we'll have a good time. And Jesus looks to his disciples and says, no, I'm, I'm preaching. Don't interrupt my message. You feed them. Can you imagine the disciples? 5,000 men, the Bible tells us. 5,000 men. So you can account probably... 10, 11,000, 12,000, some people say 15,000 people, all right? 5,000 people, Jesus, men, and Jesus looks at them and says, you feed them. Opportunistic. The disciples, they were followers of Jesus, therefore they were imitators of God. They were opportunistic. They brought a boy to Jesus and said, Jesus, we found the opportunity. There's a boy here. He's got five fish and two loaves. Or two loaves, or two fish and five loaves. No, five fish and two loaves. <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. Jesus says to them, feed them. And they're like, D -d 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 you can't spread this. I mean, everybody would get one crumb. That's not going to do anything but make them more hungry. It's like when you chew gum when you're hungry. And Jesus says, do it. And they start breaking it and they start passing it around. You know the story. You've heard the story. All of a sudden they come back and there's 12 baskets left of leftovers. He took the most of the opportunity. It was an impossible situation, but Jesus made it possible. 
so you and I may face impossible opportunities or impossible situations, but don't let it get you down, but take the most of your opportunities because God is with you, and you and I are imitators of God. Are you with me tonight? I have got to move. Wow, okay. You remember when I first started preaching here, I talked really fast. I'm going to start talking like that, okay? You, we can talk like this, okay? Now we're going to go from point number three to point number four. Oh, I'm just kidding. I'm just teasing. Translators back, they're going, Whoa. No. Imitators of God are number three. Let's go through this. Imitators of God are number three, disciplined. They understand that the, that the words that they say, that the actions that they carry, that the things that they do in life represent God because they are imitators of Christ. They are imitators of God. If you are an imitator of God, at some point you've probably said, I'm a Christian. And when you say that, people are watching you. So now when you make a bad move, you are an ambassador, the Bible tells us, that you are a representative of God. So when you make stupid decisions and you lose it, or you do that thing on the freeway that you do oh so well with that one finger on your hand. <laughs> want to give them what is it? No, I'm not going to go there. You see, imitators of God are disciplined. We hold, we withhold, we do not let the flesh control us anymore. Look what the Bible says, look what Paul the Apostle says to the, to, the, to, to the church. In Ephesians, the 18th verse now, 19th, he says, do not be drunk with wine. Oh, man, I don't even got time to go there with you tonight. Oh, that's a whole message right there on its own. Which is in dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making medley in your heart to the Lord. Look what Paul says, which is, do not be drunk with wine, which is in dissipation, which is in excess. Look what he says. I'll show it to you in the New, Li New Living Translation, a modern translation. Again, we'll put it up. He says, don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Now, I don't have time to go to you with my stance or your stance on what you believe on alcohol or, or what. I'm not going to go there tonight. We don't have time. That's a whole message on its own. But here, what Paul the Apostle is saying is, do not let the flesh rule you. Because I don't know about you. I've been around drunk people before in my life. And I, I, I don't know. I know that there's, you know, different things about your, your weight and how your blood flows and all that. But for the most part, drunk people don't get drunk off of one glass. Right? It's two, three, four, six, 15, 36 pack. <laughs> and so he says, listen, don't be drunk. Don't. Live a life that is controlled by your fleshly desires. So here, he's, even though he's speaking about alcohol, the, the idea of, of us, you and I being disciplined, goes far beyond alcohol, goes far beyond drugs, goes far beyond our language. Why? Because you and I are representatives, imitators of God. Therefore, you and I have got to be controlled and be disciplined in ourselves so that we live a life that is, representing, that is representing God in a glorious manner, that we are glorifying God in our lives, not destroying our witness. Are you with me tonight? And so as difficult as it is, you and I have got to live a life of discipline. It means that we can't give them that Hawaiian hello on the freeway anymore. It means that we can't say those words that we said when we were in the dark before. It means that we can't have that sexual immorality that we had when we lived in the darkness before. Because you and I have now got to be disciplined. Why? Because the light has shined upon us. And when the light shines on something, it, it illuminates it. And the Bible tells us, Paul told us that you and I have become lights ourselves. And now people are looking at the light. And we can't let that light go out. Because we give in to our flesh. It goes well beyond drinking. What about the things that take your eyes off of God, that draw you away from God? Remember, the, the Bible, in, in, in just a few verses ago, Paul didn't just talk about uh, uh, sexual immorality. He talked about greediness. He says, if you're a greedy person, you're an you're, uh, uh, idolater because you're worshiping money or you're worshiping wealth more than God. For that, I want to refer you to Sunday night's message, Pastor Dan's message about looking away and looking up to God, looking away from the things that draw your attention from God and looking back to God. I want to refer you to that. Go get that or go online and listen to that one. Man, there's so much for you to do. But we're going to move on. Number four, imitators of God are thankful. 
Imitators of God are thankful. Now, I'm going to say this. Two weeks ago, here I was up here talking about keeping the spirit of Christmas alive. So I don't want to spend too much time on this because, for one, I've already gone well over time. And I know you all want to go home and I want to get you there. But secondly, because I don't need to beat that dead horse, even though it's not a dead horse. But on occasion, let me say this. The Bible on several occasions challenges us, encourages us, pushes us to live a thankful life. And that we can't, even though I talked about it just two weeks ago on this very night, here in this very service on a Wednesday night, talking about keeping the spirit of Christmas alive, you and I have got a calling, have got a responsibility, especially if we want to imitate God, to be thankful for what we've been given. To be grateful for what we've been given. Look what Paul the Apostle says in Ephesians, the fifth chapter. He says, Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse number 20, giving thanks always for all things. Look at your neighbor and say, all things. Look at your other neighbors say all things. things. Now he didn't say giving thanks always for some things. He said giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I don't know about you, but there are things in my life that I'm not necessarily thankful for. I am not thankful for my electric bill in August. (laughs) Right? I am not thankful that when the Santa Ana winds come, they blow everybody's garbage into my house. There are things in life that I'm not thankful for. Now, we can go deeper. You may be not thankful because you feel like you haven't been handed a full deck of cards. There are things in your life, man, I'm not thankful because that person next to me has got something more than I got. I'm not thankful to God because I feel like I have been neglected on this or that. And there might be some things that are deep inside of you that you're neglecting on giving God thanks for. And you're robbing yourself. You're robbing the blessing that God has for you because you're stopping yourself from being an imitator of God. Because you're so focused on what you don't have or what you think you should have that you lose track of what you do have. Now, I don't want to be on a soapbox and I don't want to play this harp and I don't want to do this thing. But, you know, if if you've ever been on a missions trip, if you've ever been to a third world country, the fact is you and I who live in America, whether whether you are successful in business or you live below that poverty line that they've established, you and I have it well. We have it very good. I remember I've spent a month in Africa. It was amazing how many people don't have shoes. I spent two weeks in Peru on the other side of the Andes Mountains, and it's amazing how many people live and sleep on dirt. And what happens with you and I in our society, in our day and age, is we get so wrapped up in what we can have and what we should have and what we feel like is our right to have because we live in a blessed nation, in a blessed time, that we take what is inessential and call it essential to life And therefore, we lose the gratitude of what really is essential to life. And then you start to look at the person to your left, to your right, and say, well, they make $150,000 a year, and I make $26,000 a year. Why, God, did you do this to me? When the fact is, when the truth is, when the reality of life is, you got shoes on your feet, you just ate a warm meal, you got a car, even though maybe you don't have enough money to put gas in it, you got one. You know, you didn't sleep under a bridge. Your kids are in school. Your, your, your kids ate a warm meal. Nobody stole your daughter and sold her into the sex slave or sex trade. You understand that you and I have such a wonderful life here in our sheltered community that we have so much to be grateful for. And I'm not trying to be on my soapbox, but what I'm saying is, you ever heard that statement, you never know what you have until you lost it? So we've got to go back to the essentials of life. It's not bad to be successful. It's not bad to have good things. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that you and I have got to be thankful for all things, always, to God. Whether it's good or it's bad, because God has blessed you and I. I'm sorry if that offends some of you or if that hurts your feelings. But you and I have got to understand. And that's why fasting is so good for us. Because we give up things that we like. Oh my goodness, Pastor Jim was talking last week about fasting. I was sitting at home watching on the internet while my wife was here. So, so I was watching a little girl and he was talking about fasting. I told my wife, girl, I'm going to chow down on the cookies tonight because I'm going to give them up. <laughs> sure enough, on Friday they come over and somebody brought a big old raspberry cheesecake. You know, you know that statement, you never know what you had until you lost it. But I know that after my fast is over that I'm going to look at that cheesecake with a whole new light. 
But it's the truth in everything. It's the truth in the little things. I'm not grateful for my electric bill, but I'm thankful that I had air conditioning when it was 117 degrees outside. Okay, one more for tonight. I know we're gone late. Can you handle one more? Can we do one more? I talked your ears off. I'm sorry. One more for tonight. Imitators of God are, number five, servants. Imitators of God are servants. You know, Jesus Christ did not come on a high horse. He did not come born in a palace. He did not come born to royalty. He did not come with manservants and maidservants. You know the story. He was born in a manger of a virgin, betrothed to a carpenter. He lived a humble life, and he lived a life of service. If you and I want to imitate God, we've got to be servants. We've got to serve one another. Look what it says in the Word of God. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verse number 21, says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. You can translate that word submitting to one another that can be translated as to be subject to one another. So it doesn't mean that you have to come under, you have to be slave to your neighbor, but you are subject to the one another in the fear of God. That means that you and I cannot live a life of solitary goals that are looking out for you and I or to looking out for ourselves only, but rather you and I have got to live a life to understand that we are in our uh, imitation of God. We are subject to one another. Therefore, it is our duty, it is our responsibility to serve one another in the fear of God, to look out for our fellow brother and sister in Christ in the fear of God. Could you imagine what Christianity would be like if Jesus did not serve? Could you imagine what it would be like if Jesus came and just told us that we have to serve while he sat on a throne and dictated the law to us? But rather, God came and showed us the example. Interesting story in Matthew, the 20th chapter. Now, I will put this one up on the overhead. The disciples' mom, some of the disciples' moms comes to, one, one of the disciples, uh, two of the disciples' mom comes to Jesus. You know moms, they're looking out for their kids. She comes to Jesus, she says, Jesus, when my sons go to heaven, can, can one of them sit on the right side of you and one of them sit on the left side of you? Because she's mom, you know how moms are, man. I'm, my mom is my biggest fan. You know, if you're a mom and you've got kids, you know you want the best for them. So here's the mom. She's got good intentions, but she's trying to get, she's trying to play favorite with her, with her sons to Jesus. Say, hey, come on. Throw my, throw my boys a bone, okay? Or uh, get them on a little higher stool than everybody else. And Jesus says, no, 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 it's not like that. It doesn't work like that. And now I'm going to take you there and it says in Matthew, the 20th chapter, verse number 24. It says, when the other ten disciples heard what James and John had asked, and I see they got the credit for what their mama had asked, they were indignant. They were not happy with their fellow disciples. But Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers in this world Lord over their people. And officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, you and I, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man, Jesus, did not come to serve, to be served but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. God led by example. Jesus led by example. He didn't come. He washed the feet of the disciples. Jesus hung out with the outcasts, with the rejects, with the social letdowns, with the sick, with the poor, with the, the hated, with the greedy. He hung out with everybody who nobody wanted to be around. That's where Jesus was. You've heard Pastor Jim say it. If, if Jesus was here today, he'd be in San Bernardino. <laughs> you and I have got to be subject to one another, to serve one another, to not live a life solely about ourselves, but to live a life that blesses one another. I had the privilege this last weekend of conducting a memorial service or a celebration service, rather, of a saint of God that was uh, here at this church for many, many a year. And it was so interesting for me to see what I knew about this person. And I knew how this person was a, was a people person. And this, this person had reached out to people that I knew about. But then they had the open mic and they had the series of where people were giving their testimony or giving their statements about this person. And I was blown away to see that this person went over and above what I even thought 
Here's a thought for you, and I want to leave you with this, and we'll conclude with this. I thought that this person had this, a certain legacy. You may think that you have done good to one person or two people, and that may be good. But really, while you're long gone, you have no idea the impact that you have on the lives of people around you. You may think you did good for one or two, and when come to find out, if you are a servant to others, like this lady was, that there will be hundreds of people ready to give their testimony of what you did for them, whether it was just a smile, a handshake, a prayer, uh, 10 minutes to talk with somebody, a cup of coffee, a phone call, whatever it is, you don't know the legacy that you can leave if all you do is look out for one another, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are called to be imitators of God. We're called to be wise, not living foolishness or rash. We're called to be opportunistic, making the most of every day. We're called to be disciplined, not letting the desires of our flesh rule over us. We're called to be thankful, to appreciate everything we have been given. And we are called to be servants, to step out of our comfort zones and do something for someone else. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? Give God a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'll tell you what, I'm excited. I know that God is good. Amen? Amen. Hey, what, did a bomb go off? Where's everybody going? Church isn't out yet. Hey, we're not done yet. People are like, bomb? What? No, no, it really didn't. No. Listen, I want to do something. I want to take some, take some time. Let's do this. Do you mind if I switch it up? Okay. I feel like since y'all feel like you need to go, let's just do this. I went late. I'm sorry. Let me ask you a question. Just give me a moment more of your attention. We'll do, what, we'll do the other part in a minute. Let me ask you this question. If you were to leave this place tonight and you were to die, heaven forbid, pray that's not the case, but if you were to cease to exist tonight, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a relatively simple question. Nobody's going to know that answer except you and God. And I want you to examine yourself. The Bible tells us that a man ought to examine himself from time to time. So let's go over some of those answers that you might have had. You know, nowhere in the Word of God can you find that because you think you're going to get to heaven, because you hope you're going to get to heaven, because you really want to get there, that you're going to get there. You say, man, Pastor Luke, I really want to go to heaven. I think I'm going to get to heaven. If you were to die and you think you're going to get to heaven, you will not find it anywhere in the Word of God that because you think that you're going to get to heaven that you're going to find yourself there. You just can't get to heaven that way. Did you know you can't get to heaven because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, or as a Muslim, or any other type of world religion? So therefore, by default or by classification, that means you must, uh, you must be a Christian or get into heaven? Did you know nowhere in the Word of God will you find that you can't get there because you weren't raised as some other world religion? That must mean, oh, I guess I'm going to get there. No. It's not in the Word of God. You know, you might say, well, but Pastor Luke, you know, my parents told me as a child that I'm a Christian. I went to churches. I went to Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes. I was baptized as a baby or Christian. I've got a, a religious cross or jewelry. I come to church. I'm here, here I am starting off my new year right with God. Doesn't that mean something? Doesn't that account for something? Did you know nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because your parents told you you were a Christian? because you were raised in church, because you went to Sunday school or Sabbath school, school classes? Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you wear religious jewelry or because you got a Jesus tattoo? Did you know nowhere in the Word of God because you sit in church that you're going to get into heaven? Nowhere will you find that. What? It's not that way. Hey, did you know you might even say this? Well, Pastor Luke, I'm a good person. Good people go to heaven. I don't cheat on my taxes. I've never done anything wrong. I've never robbed the 7-Eleven. So therefore, I'm going to go to heaven. Did you know nowhere in the Word of God can you find it because you're a good person, you're going to get into heaven? Because you give to charitable organizations and because you help fight AIDS in Africa or world hunger? No, it's not in there. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. The truth is, is that nothing you and I could do on the outside, on the external, by our actions alone, can get us into heaven. It's God's heaven. It's God's way. The only way we could get there is God's way. And Jesus tells us the way. Jesus Christ says that he is the way, the truth, 
and the life. And no man, hey, hey, no man goes to heaven except through him. So you can't get to heaven your way. Hey, you can't get to heaven my way. You can't get to heaven because you're a good person, because you think, hope, or wish. You can't get to heaven because your parents told you so. Hey, did you know you can't get to heaven because you served in youth or in your children's ministry or because you sang in the choir or you carried the pastor's Bible? Did you know you can't get to heaven because you've memorized John 3, 16? Let me show it to you in the Word of God in John, the third chapter. A man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he asks Jesus, Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? The question we're talking about right now. The Bible says about Nicodemus two things. He was a Pharisee and a leader of the Jews. What that means to you and I is that in our day and age, Nicodemus was like a PhD. Nicodemus had dedicated at least the first 20 years of his life to studying and memorizing the word of God. Nicodemus wore all the right clothes. Nicodemus taught the word of God in the temple. Nicodemus gave to the poor. He said all the right things. He had more scripture memorized than you and I could think imaginable. And yet Jesus' response to him was not, was not, keep on going. But rather, he looked at Nicodemus and he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. That's how you do it. You've heard that term, popular culture, society, Hollywood movies, they've made a mockery out of that. You think a weirdo out of control, Christianity. You know what, here, listen, I'm not here to argue what they say. I don't care what they say because from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. That's what God's after. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. Let me prove it to you again in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. Jesus Christ is speaking to the church. People like you and I, hearing the word of God, doing good things. And he says to the church, I know your works, I know your deeds. And when I come back, I'm coming again. And when I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Whoa! A shocking statement, gruesome and grotesque designed to get your attention. And what Jesus Christ is saying is if you are lukewarm, you are deceived, you are tricked into thinking you're going to get into heaven when you're really not. What Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me define it to you in terms of your relationship with God. Lukewarm means that you've given him a little bit, you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out, you're a little bit up, you're a little bit down, occasional church attendance, you're kind of floating around, bouncing around, and coming to church for a little while, going away and doing your own thing, doing some of the things of the world, doing some of the things that we read about today in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, coming back to church, doing it again, ping-ponging between the world and God, riding the fence. And Jesus Christ says, if that's you, you are deceived, you are tricked into thinking you're going to get into heaven when you're really not. So how do we get there? It's God's heaven. It's God's way. I already told you, Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life. So let's do it God's way. Let's not do it your way. Let's not get there my way. Let's not try to do it some well-meaning church committee's way. Let's do it God's way. Jesus Christ says this. He says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. And if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. So in a moment, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. Just like that. Smack my hand on the Bible. And when I count to three, I want to give you the opportunity to ensure your place with God in heaven for eternity. And what I'm going to do when I count to three, in a moment I want to give you the opportunity, you want to hit my hand and go three. I want you to get your hand up. If that's you in this place, we'll do it all together at the same time. What you're doing by raising your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, I acknowledge that I want to give Jesus Christ all of my heart, all of my life. Pastor Luke, I want to go to heaven. I want to ensure that I, that I go to heaven and I leave hell behind. You say, Pastor Luke, if I raise my hand, the people I came with, the person sitting next to me, they're going to know I'm going to be embarrassed. Hey, you know what? You might be embarrassed. But wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell? You see, the decision's yours. God's not a manipulator. God's not a conniver. He's not going to force you or make you. You can't raise the hand of the person next to you. Each and every one of us has got to make this decision on our own. But know this. That God wouldn't ask you to do something that he hasn't already done or he hasn't already gone through himself. And he sent his only begotten son, his most valuable possession, Jesus Christ, to come and die a beaten, bloody mess on the cross. To hung naked on the cross. To bear our sin and our shames. 
He's already gone through that moment. He's there with you. If you can't raise your hand in a warm and welcome and loving place like the church, how are you going to expect to be imitators of God in the real world? I'm, you say, Pastor Luke, I don't, I'm uncomfortable with that. I feel like you're pressuring me. I feel like you're pushing me. Guess what? I am. Because don't you know that the devil is pushing you, that the world is pushing you and pressuring you to keep your hand down and keep doing what you're doing and go to hell. But I love you enough I respect you enough, I honor you enough to push you, to rub your hairs the wrong way so that you raise your hand and you make sure that you get yourself into heaven for eternity, forever and ever and ever and ever. Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've never given them all of your heart, if you've never given them all of your life, if you've never made that before, I want you to get your hand up in a moment, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, you can put it right back down. Who should raise their hand? I'll, I'll count you in just a minute, my friend. Who should raise their hand? If you've never made a public profession of your faith, in a moment, just get your hand up and say, here I am. Pastor Luke, I want to give them all my heart. I want to give them all my life. I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge it. I'll put it right back down. We'll move on from there. Finally, who should raise their hands if you've been living lukewarm? Doing your own thing instead of God's thing. Get your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. Let's make today the day. You go forward for God and get yourself in the kingdom. In the king I'll get you in just a moment when I count to three. Hands are going up all over the place already. Don't leave today without making sure. Hey, here I am. I'm rubbing you the wrong way. It's all right because I love you enough to do it. So in a moment, if that's you from the family rooms, from the back, from the front to the, from the, front to the back, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter how old or how young you are. Get your hands up on the count of three if that's you in this place. Get ready. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in the house today. Where are you guys at that I saw you? All right, here we go. One, two, three, four. Oh, keep your hands up so I can see you. Five, I see you. All right, where are you at? Six, I see you. Seven, I see you. Eight, nine, I see you back there. Ten, I see you right here. Eleven, twelve, thirteen, I see you. Where are you at? If you had your hand up, let me see it. Fourteen, I see you. Fourteen wise people. Fifteen, I see you in the family room. Sixteen, seventeen, I see you guys right over here. Seventeen, eighteen, I see you back there in the family room. Eighteen wise people. How many? Four? Five. Oh, what is that? Nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three. I see you back there. Pastor Jim's a better counter than me. Michael, you're raising your hand somewhere over 20, 24, I see you. Where are you at, number 25? Say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Get your hand up so I can see it. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you if that's you in this place. Get your hand up. Let's go forward for God today. Where are you at? If you know there's 24, oh, you know there's 25. Where are you at in this place, number 25? I'm waiting on you. Come on, where are you at? Say, man, I wonder if this guy shut up. He's already gone late enough. Anybody else in the place today? 25. I see you back there in the family room. 25. Why don't you praise the Lord for 25 wise people? Hallelujah. Amen. Well, hey, here's what we're going to do. For the 25 of you that raised your hand in the family rooms in the back and the front, doesn't matter where you're at, you said you were going to give them all your heart. You said you were going to give them all your life. Don't get saved by raising your hand. You acknowledge that you want to get saved. That's what I said. You get saved by asking him to come in your heart, come in your life. I want to pray with you. So what I'm going to do in a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. If you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand, I want you to be bold. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your Bible, a friend, uh, if you need a friend. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Get into the aisles and come and let's meet here at the altar. Let's pray together. Let's change destinies. As we stand together, hey, don't leave this place. For those of you who are coming up, come on up. For those of you who, are on, who aren't, don't walk out on us right now. Come on up. That's you. Come on up. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. You can come. You can come, come on, come home to Jesus. You can come, come on. You're not too old, you're not too young. Get out of your chair, come on down. Every moment I'm away. Listen, guys, got to do something. Got to smile. You're not going to a funeral, all right? You're going to a birth celebration. Your birth today is the first day of the rest of your life. 
The Bible says when you accept Jesus Christ, you become a new creation. You're something new. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you? Wave bigger. Come on. That's Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's one of the coolest guys. I'll tell you what, he's one of the nicest guys you're going to meet. Pastor Joel's going to do a couple things. He's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. I'm as weird as it gets, I promise you. He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart. So he's going to lead you in a prayer. He's going to give you some free things, some free literature that our senior pastors wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny. It's an easy reading book that says, hey, I just got saved. Now what do I do? Helps you kind of get strong in the ways of God. Helps you kind of understand some things about the Word of God to get you strong. And he's going to do one more thing. He's going to invite you into a program that we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You know, you go to the gym. You get a personal trainer. The personal trainer makes sure that you work the right muscles. They make sure that you work your biceps and your triceps and your deltoids and your flaptoids and whatever other muscles you got in your body to make sure they help you get strong. Well, a personal trainer is somebody that will meet with you. They'll teach you some things about the Word of God right before service. They'll buy you a cup of coffee, get you here, get here a couple minutes early. They'll meet with you, teach you some things about the Word of God so they get you strong like a, like a personal trainer would, a friend, somebody that will come alongside of you, help you out, get you strong so that you'll go back to the junk that you came from. So I want to ask one more thing before we go. I know you're like, dude, Pastor Luke, my brain's going to explode. One more thing. Hey, listen, the Word of God spoke to you here. Now, I'm not asking you to, to join a church. I want to put my application. If you're not a member of a church somewhere, I want to put my application in. Hey, I want to be your pastor. I love you enough to fight for you. But here's what I want to do. I want to ask something. I want to ask you to commit to serve God, to commit to sit under the Word of God here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center, to listen and to apply the Word of God in your life for 12 months, one year. And I promise you, 365 days from now, You'll look back at your year and be amazed at what God has done in your life. Today. I promise you, my lion, give God a chance and see what happens. Would you guys just go right over there with Pastor Joel?